You can move to the second speaker. So, Annette King, and she is also a painting uh, conservator, and she got her master from Courtauld Institute in London, and she is currently a painting conservator at the Tate Gallery in London. So, you still have you know, 20 minutes, and then... Thank you. You're welcome. Well, thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here and um, fascinating talk so far. It's, a, it's going to be an amazing day. Um, so I'd like to talk about our painting, uh, The Three Dancers by Picasso. Um, and The Three Dancers was already in demand before Picasso had finished painting, as Andre Breton begged Picasso to allow him to be the first to publish it. While the paint was still wet, Man Ray was commissioned to photograph it. And Breton wrote to Picasso apologizing for the quality of the photographs. Nevertheless, following desperate appeals from Breton, it appeared on the 15th of July, 1925, under the title Girls Dancing in Front of a Window, in issue four of La Révolution Surréaliste, along with Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, painted 18 years before, giving it automatic status with this earlier masterpiece. The Three Dancers was acquired by Tate directly from Picasso in 1965, and it had remained in his personal possession for 40 years, as despite pressure from his dealer and his friends to sell it, Picasso had refused. One of the most prominent avant-garde artists, and with his malleable national identity, Picasso represented the ideal figure of internationalism in the increasingly conservative and nationalistic atmosphere of France after World War I. His work was much in demand and continues to be so today. In his early career, he had eschewed the conventional exhibition spaces and gone for the more marginal venues following the lead of his dealers. It was first exhibited in Paris in 1932. And um, here's a, a shot of it there in a white, whitish gray frame. It's difficult to tell from the black and white. However, his dealers were very outward looking and the three dancers went on to be exhibited abroad, gaining Picasso an international profile as one of the world's leading avant-garde artists. This is a quick summary here of everywhere the painting has been that I could find from the records. And as you can see, this is, um, is this the, oh, no, sorry. This, the left column is everywhere it traveled when it was in Picasso's possession and then the right-hand column is everywhere it's been since it's been at Tate. It appears in a photograph of the second San Paolo Biennale in 1954 in a showcase of European modernism of which Guernica was the highlight. Owning his key paintings meant that Picasso had some degree of control as to where and how they were exhibited. In this photograph, it appears in a simple white frame, unglazed. This was possibly the frame in which it arrived in Tate in 1960, although presumably Picasso or his dealers changed frames at will, because they don't always seem to be the same in earlier photographs. It was already well-traveled, unglazed without support from behind, when it came to Tate Gallery's major Picasso retrospective in 1960. The day after the exhibition closed, the Times reported that the trustees of Tate hope to retain one of the paintings on loan permanently for the gallery if there is sufficient public support. Tate Gallery trustee, surrealist artist, and friend of Picasso, Roland Penrose, was given the task of persuading him to sell it, which took him almost five years. So this is the three dancers today. The Three Dancers is in demand for almost constant display at Tate sites, as well as being requested for international loan. In-house research in the 1980s and 1990s into packing and transport of paintings on canvas, and um, as, as Marion mentioned earlier, the study of vibration during transport and mechanical failure of the paint film, um, and the results that actually traveling and vibration didn't cause issues, it was more the support of the, the canvas, um, and growing pressure at UK governmental level to increase public access to national collections had, by the early 21st century, led to the institutional assumption that the majority of paintings can be made safe for travel on a regular basis, subject to reassessment of condition after each journey. Loans obviously also have a political importance between institutions, which needs to be taken into consideration for each request. 
However, this poses a dilemma to the conservator. Having a work on its original strainer, possibly with an original attachment, unlined, unvarnished, and in this case, literally as it left the artist's studio, is increasingly rare for paintings of this age. The conservation record, established in 1965, shortly after acquisition that same year, states, generally in good condition, examined before sending for exhibition in Paris. Condition not altered, except for the cracks on the center figure showing in a few places. A light tendency to cleavage. These areas have been therefore treated with wax resin impregnation from the face of the painting. After return from Paris, the treatment as below should be carried out and possibly wax relining as a preventive treatment to arrest the deterioration of the canvas. Thankfully, the wax resin lining as a prophylactic measure did not take place. Um, the painting came to date on its original strainer, as you can see here, unlined, unvarnished, and there's a photograph of the painting on acquisition in 1965, one of the, um, showing the strainer as a simple softwood, um, non-standard size strainer, held together with four nails at the mortise and tenon joints at the corners. The canvas was attached with tacks at the edges, and you can see some outlines accentuated by subsequent oil applications seeping through scored lines on the painted canvas. I don't know if you can see those, particularly on the right-hand side there, the, the breast and the arm. There is also a hessian patch in the upper left corner, a tear repair carried out when the painting was owned by Picasso, possibly by Picasso himself. It has been retained as it remains effective. The painting was fitted with perspex and a backboard with holes in it, presumably to let the air circulate behind the painting. And it was noted in 1970 that a band of black dirt had been drawn into the structure by the static of the perspex and deposited on the lower quarter of the painting. The dirt was removed in 1971, but the backboard and perspex retained, so the process repeated itself, interestingly. After several loans in the 1960s, the painting was requested by the Museum of Modern Art New York in 1979, and it was deemed too unstable to travel. In its current state, um, and when it was agreed for loan, the decision was taken to carry out a prior conservation intervention. It was noted in 1975 that the edges appear to be in potentially fragile condition with many little splits and holes from restretching. The painting was removed from its trainer, and in 1979, the photographs show interesting details. Um, and if you look at the bottom picture on the right there, there were groups of three tack holes along the top edge and the bottom edge, very close to the fold-over crease, uh, suggesting that the painting was re-stretched onto the current strainer and had begun life on another support. Unusually, there were tacks through the front of the painting as well at the bottom edge, which had been painted over. Perhaps the canvas had originally been attached to a wall or a panel from the front. In 1979, the strainer was replaced with a sturdy new stretcher and a loose lining of linen impregnated with Paraloid B72. The edges were strip lined with linen strips impregnated with B371 and heat sealed. And the painting was stretched over the loose lining and attached with copper steel tacks through wax linen washers using the original tack holes. In 1973, a partial X-ray was taken, and um, it showed the central section, revealing a completely different image underneath. With funding from a Cloth Workers Fellowship in 2014, a full technical examination and new imaging and documentary study was instigated to research the origins of painting on this canvas further. The results have already been published in detail with numerous images, but I'll just do a quick summary of some findings here. It seems from the X-radiographs, microscopic examination, and observing colors through the surface cracks that there could be at least three paintings on this canvas. So that one's from 1973. That was an uh, analog X-ray in 2012, and that was a digital X-ray in 2014, I think. The canvas was primed with a gray ground made from lead white with bone black in a drying oil, visible on all the edges of the painting and on the reverse fold over edge. The top edge shows the sort of damage caused by the fabric being gathered and crushed, as would happen if the pre-primed canvas was stretched onto a new support. There's a slight cusping at the edges of the exposed fabric. I don't know how you get the little dot, but if you look at the, the ragged edges of the canvas, there's a little bit of cusping, which doesn't seem to relate to the former stretching. Um, so this, the edges have possibly been trimmed as well. This begs the questions, if the painting had been in Picasso's possession all this time, why was it restretched, and was it done by Picasso? 
It must have been done with his knowledge, and what was its former function? This sadly does not seem to have been discussed with Penrose and remains unanswered. The grey ground potentially played an important role in the, fine, in the early stages of development of this painting, and Picasso deliberately retained glimpses of it in the finished work. It appears to be a conscious choice of Picasso's to leave the grey ground exposed where the clasped hands meet in the centre of the painting. So you can see there, just next to the blue, is the, actually the ground retained. In the raised hand of the right figure, the white paint is fragile and has cracked with losses down to the canvas. The paint build-up here is very simple. Grey ground, then white, applied up to and in places over the black at the top, which you can see in the top left there. In ultraviolet light, the cross-sections show that there are two separate layers of white which fluoresce differently possibly zinc white applied over an earlier lead white, as you can see in the UV image. Um, moving there. The outline of the breast can be seen as a simple black line on the gray ground. It seems possible that from these glimpses that this figure began life as a simple grisaille design, and the figure outlined with black contours and the body fleshed out with white. A search for grisaille paintings by Picasso revealed the Three Graces, 1923, which was illustrated by John Richardson. This is similar in size to the three dancers, and all the figures, although the figures are very different and not depicted as nudes, there are possibly similarities in execution. Grisaille paintings are mentioned by Richardson in connection with Count Etienne de Beaumont. Having been involved with costume design for an event in May of 1923, Picasso was commissioned in the autumn to paint four decorative panels on classical subjects for the music room of de Beaumont's Hotel Particulier, which Picasso seems to envis have envisaged as grisaille paintings. However, this commission remained unfulfilled as Paul Rosenberg, Picasso's dealer, told him to turn down commissions that entailed a lot of work, little compensation for the artist, and no profit whatsoever for the dealer. Letters from de Beaumont give details of the dimensions of the canvases to be painted, which are very similar to the three dancers. Another artist friend is said to have seen a grisaille of three graces in Picasso's studio at this time. So it's possible that an incomplete grisaille painting of three graces lies underneath this painting. X-radiographs. So any grisaille design would be poorly rendered to x-rays, and, x and Picasso later added thick layers of oil paint, which made it more difficult. The x-radiograph of this painting is fascinating, however. It reveals another completely different image beneath the surface, with three more conventional dancers. And these are x-radiographs overlaid with color and raking light, but also we've reversed the black and the white, so the uh, thinnest lines appear white, and it allows a little bit more um, brush strokes, this sort of body of paint to be seen. The figures have been convincingly compared to a tiny painting, location now unknown, the dance from 1923. The three figures which emerge in the X-radiograph are more rounded, classical nudes, stately poetic poses. They have sharp outlines, possibly in black paint, and have been fleshed out with dense paint. So if I go back to the X-ray. There we go. Um, the figure on the right is most clearly defined because most thinly painted on top. Uh, whereas the figure on the left has received a much heavier secondary application of paint, which largely obscures the underlayers and the x-rays. The dance 1923 was photographed only in black and white and cannot provide information about colour. The first colours applied to the grey were, were black, uh, were, sorry, were white and then black. And the grey ground and white are discrete layers which had dried before further colour was added. There's a widely distributed layer of blue paint which has even flowed into an existing crack in the white paint, implying that the grey and white layers are somewhat earlier. Unlike the white layers, the blue was still soft in places when brown was applied over it. So this begs the question whether Picasso had continued painting since he'd done the, the, the blue and it was still soft when he repainted it in 1925. We know that his friend Ramon Pichot died on the 1st of March 1925 and that it was finished in June 25 when it appeared in the Surrealist magazine. So it could well be that he'd, he was continually working on it. We've also got amazing colours underneath the top layers. In the drying cracks, a multitude of colours are visible. And um, it seems there may well have been palette scrapings. I can't really tell how these stripes were made, but they're sort of multi-colours underneath. 
A small loss in the flesh of the straight leg of the left figure shows a layer structure of the paint down to the canvas. The gray ground is covered with white, then there is a black layer covered with darker pink, and then the paler pink of the, of the top layer. This may represent the three separate campaigns of painting, from grisaille to the flesh of the first figure, and finally the pink of the upper surface. It's known that Pichot died on the 1st of March, as I've said, and there was a stimulus for the dramatic changes of the final image of the three dancers. Um, you can see through the, the drying cracks that there are colours underneath that don't match what we know as the upper painting. Picasso declared that he was aware of and liked the cracks, and these imperfections actually give an invaluable window into the history of the painting. And Picasso seems deliberately to have allowed glimpses of earlier iterations. Picasso scholar John Finney has suggested that Picasso had a form of mal d'archive or archive fever, leaving visual references in his works to what lay underneath. And the exposed areas of grey in the hands may be, and, and wit pay witness to this. In this painting in particular, the imperfections are key to the appearance and give the painting its unique character. Luckily, they've been preserved, and respecting Picasso's wishes, the cracks have been untouched. To prevent deterioration of these thick paint films and to support the original unlined canvas, not only was the loose lining kept in place, but solid panel inserts were attached to the openings of the stretcher. And these provide extra support from behind to minimize any movement during transport. The painting is displayed in a new frame made in 2012, glazed for the first time with lam laminated low reflecting glass and an additional backboard. So, it often seems that we as conservators are being asked to fulfill two opposing functions. On the one hand, to preserve fragile paintings in as close to their original state as possible, without losing vital clues as to the origins of the work and the materials the artist used, both paint and structural. On the other hand, we in Tate at least must make these works robust enough to withstand constant display and loan, with all the risks handling and transport can engender. Attitudes and approaches have changed over the decades, informed by targeted research. The prophylactic wax resin lining used until the mid-70s in the UK has given way to minimal intervention. Original strainers are retained and strengthened where possible, and fragile edges are repaired locally. Removable insert panels are, refer are preferred to loose lining. Surfaces are protected with glazing where possible. So I think conservators should really value original features over a major treatment undertaken simply to make work safe to travel. There are examples in Tate's collection where paintings are deemed too fragile for loan in their original condition, and this is increasingly respected by the institution. However, given that this painting was treated nearly 40 years ago and has travelled extensively in between, hopefully this is a good compromise, although certain things are lost, um, it still retains the essential structure of the work. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, <for> over. <laughs> for being in time too. Uh, okay, <laughs> second done. So it is time for a very quick, fast question in case. Is there any questions from my audience? So I have, no, I have one just in case. I mean, have you considered to try to see if it's possible to reconstruct the paintings behind the the, 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 the visible one, the colors, something like that, using other techniques? Um, we don't have... Uh, no, oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, well, we, don't, we don't have that sort of technology. I know you can do mapping and mm -hmm. things. Um, so we're, we're working with you know, what we have at the moment. We would absolutely love that to take place, but it's all a question of equipment and funding, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> but it I would know, be it's great. A, it's all a matter of money. <laughs> yes, it's all a matter of money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So at the moment, we just have to make do with x-rays and, and looking through the microscope. But, um, Perfect. But yes. thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>